Well, good morning, everybody, and it's good to have you along. I'll just adjust this mic volume. Um, why don't we go straight into a word of prayer and just ask the Lord to bless us wherever we are. Um, we have a number of meetings happening, and we truly do want the Lord to bless you in your gathering this morning. So let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for this morning and thank you that we can uh, gather together as believers. And we thank you for the willingness of brothers and sisters to uh, go out of their way and gather with one another and support one another and, and to worship you together. So, Lord, we pray and we ask that you would bless each and every meeting this morning, bless each uh, believer around the world who is watching this uh, message and taking part in worshipping you. Uh, we ask you, Lord, that your name would be glorified this morning, wherever we are, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. There's been a lot happening, obviously, on the geopolitical stage, and um, a lot of that is out of my scope of understanding. But I want to encourage you this morning. I'm I'm going to have a look in Hebrews. Um, I've been wrestling with preaching from Nehemiah and uh, and Daniel um, because these were men who faced opposition and yet stood for the Lord and are recorded in Scripture as standing for the Lord and trusting the Lord. Morde Mordecai comes to mind as well. Um, but in Hebrews... Hebrews says, let us hold fast, fast, Hebrews 10, this is 23. I'll go back a little bit to 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter into uh, enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And obviously the author of Hebrews is talking about his, his death, that by his death, um, in his actual physical embodiment, uh, he has made the way for us uh, through that. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So we, we have to remember this, that God is faithful, even when we're not. God is, is faithful and he is our hope. And so we must hold fast to that. That's what the author is saying. Let us hold fast. And, and we hold fast because God is faithful. That's the key thing for us to remember. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. So this is something that we're to think about as brother and brothers and sisters, is how can we encourage each other uh, to stronger faith and to good works that glorify God? Um, this is really important for us. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, um, ashamed to say that in the past I've used this as a um, uh, proof text for why we should gather as a church, but I want to use it as a proof text as to why you should gather together as believers and not just on a Sunday morning, but um, uh, in fellowshipping together. So you and I should be fellowshipping with, with other believers and gathering together to, to encourage each other and to stir up each other uh, to faith and good works. So, you know, this is a really important aspect. So, you know, in considering um, preaching from these texts from Nehemiah and, and um, from Daniel and from Ruth, um, I want to go instead, though, to Hebrews 12. And I've spoken from this message, uh, from this passage many times uh, because it is a passage that has application to you and I. 
in our lives. So let's just look at Hebrews 12 this morning. And um, and before we do, the, the, I want to just read these words of poetry to you. One day upon Golgotha, three men died. A thief, the Christ, a thief were crucified. A cross of hope for one, hope not too late. His fellow died upon a cross of hate. Between these two, all space were not more wide. Between them and for both, Christ Jesus died. So here are two men on either side of the Saviour. And both, one would say, had equal opportunity. Both were in an equally arduous situation. But both had a different view of the Saviour. And this is where it's at for mankind. The world around us deriding and mocking Jesus. Um, even the modern church makes a mockery of Jesus. And um, there are many progressive Christians who say things like, oh, if Jesus were here today, he'd be, he'd be at the pub having a beer. Oh, really? Or he'd be at the rave. Um, you know, whatever it is, whatever useless statements people make about what Jesus might be doing. Um, but understand this, Jesus was persecuted and put to death because of his sinless perfection. Um, you know, it was the will of God. There's all these things, but... But his, his nature and character came into conflict with the religious and ruling elite of the day. And so as you and I stand for righteousness, you are going to come into conflict with the religious elite and the ruling elite of the day. When the church does not come into conflict, and, and trust me on this one, um, the, the church's compromise in these recent decades um, in being in lockstep with the world, the church's compromise there has not insulated it from political persecution, believe me. Um, in fact, all it's done has paved the way for uh, believers to be um, persecuted. That's, that's all that's happened there. So the, the church being in lockstep with the world and compromising with what the world wants and uh, all of these kinds of things, not having the spine to speak up on issues, all, all this type of stuff, all that has done has paved the way for the governments and, and for, uh, you know, societies to advance more and more antichrist uh, agendas and what this is going to mean is a, is a routine rounding up of believers as persecution increases and not only believers but anyone who identifies as being a Christian whether they are genuine believers or not they're going to be also persecuted so um, now Ravenhill and I've, I've quoted this quote before he asked how is it that the world could not get along with the only sinless man who ever lived, but it can get along with you and I just fine? You know, Leonard Ravenhill had a way of, um, as, as all of those God-fearing men did, of asking questions that dig right to the bone. How is it that the world could not get along with the only sinless man who ever lived, but it can get along with you and I just fine? So the church has taken its eyes off Jesus. And this is, this is the modern dilemma. But believers, true believers in this 
day and age, we need more than ever to put our eyes right on the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's read Hebrews 12, uh, verses 1 and onwards. We'll read a few verses here. Therefore, and we'll get to the therefore a little bit later on, uh, because it obviously pertains to the previous passages, uh, 10 and 11, but in particular um, chapter 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so closely, uh, which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, or as the ESV here says, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set at the, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Hallelujah. There's... There is a, an important aspect to this passage, and that is this call to the witnesses before. Uh, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. This is really important for us because, excuse me, it's, it's not saying that uh, the, the witnesses are the people around us um, in terms of the world looking at us. Um, the, the context of it is the passage beforehand, um, Hebrews 11, talking about by faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Um, and uh, verse 6 uh, says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And then the author goes into this list of people. And he does this by saying, by faith, by faith, uh, Noah, in verse 7, that's where he starts, by faith, Noah. And he talks about Noah, by faith, Abraham. And he keeps going through all of these people who by faith achieve so much. And with Abraham, he says that Abraham obeyed when he was called to go. In verse 10, he says, for he looked for a city whose builder and foundations um, is God. Uh, verse 13 says, These all died by way of faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. By faith they passed through, through the Red Sea, verse 29. Uh, and uh, as by dry land, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been compassed about seven days. Now, then we get down to verses 32 to 38. And what more shall we say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and uh, Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fires, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of strangers. All, all of this is so stirring and encouraging, isn't it? Verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured. By faith, they were tortured. This is the context of it, that, that through faith, their faith was in God, and as a consequence, they, there were all these incredible things that were done, um, you know, stopping the mouths of lying, lions and receiving their dead, raised to life again. But others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings, verse 36, and scourgings, yes, more of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were tempted, they were slain by, with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And one of my favorite phrases in all of scripture is the following words, Verse 38, the world was not worthy of them. 
They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, did not receive the promise, for God had provided some better thing for us that they should not be made perfect without us. Therefore, therefore, that is the, the context of the therefore in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, the author is not saying that these people are sitting in the, the great southern stand of heaven looking at the game of life. On, this, on the global MCG. That is not what the author is saying. He is saying that these people are a witness forward to us. And we're surrounded by their testimonies. You and I are surrounded by their testimonies, their stories of victory, victories through faith. So they had faith. And by that faith, they look to the eternal consequence and they were uh, so greatly blessed through their faith, they received a good report, but they did not receive the promise because God had that for the church, that they would not be perfected without the church because the church was this uh, age that, that was coming about through the Messiah uh, and through his death. And they trusted for God to help them and they persevered through persecution, trial, tragedy, poverty, brutality, wars, famines, disasters, pestilence, all of these things, trusting even though they did not see the Messiah in their lifetimes. So there's a phenomenal message here in Hebrews, isn't there? That, that you and I need to demonstrate faith. Because as you can see through all of these people, right back through Hebrews 11, by faith they did things, right? But by faith Noah moved with fear, fear prepared an ark. And by faith... Abraham obeyed when he was called to go, and uh, he looked for a city. And these all died by way of faith. By faith they passed. So there was an action that accompanied their faith. And the, the author is saying that they did this by faith, not having received the promise. Because that promise was to us and they couldn't receive that promise and be made perfect without the Messiah. So faith is, you know, faith is an issue of absolute importance. It is a cornerstone of biblical Christianity. It is the fountainhead of Christian life. Um, by faith, Abraham obeyed. So faith was at the fountainhead of his obedience. By faith, Noah, he obeyed and built an ark. Faith was at the corner, at the foundation of his obedience. So now when we consider chapter 12, verse 1, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, so the author writes and he says, um, listen, look back at the past and take heart from these people who, who were um, uh, the, the, the faith that they demonstrated was so amazing 
despite not being perfected because the Messiah hadn't come. So they had to look back at that. They had to uh, look at the present circumstances of their walk and they had to look up to Jesus. So we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Um, you know, don't, don't let this little point about these Old Testament saints um, slip you by because here are people who did not have the hindsight, the perfection of hindsight that you and I have. We can, we can look into the text of Holy Writ and we can see the Messiah in here. Um, they, they could see the Messiah by future hope. We see the Messiah by completion of that hope. Where was the word of God when Moses led the people out of Egypt? He couldn't just look into text. He wrote the first five books of Holy, Holy Writ for us, at, at least. Where was Moses had to rely by faith on the voice of God? And as we look at them, don't let that little point be overlooked. Because the lesson of faith with these men and women is that they trusted what God revealed to them. Um, you know, we have the modern day church today practicing all these things about prophecies and, and stuff. And we've got believers who go to churches and they go to church hoping that someone will have a, a word of prophecy for them. You know, I'm really looking for a word tonight from God. You know, they, they want someone to call them out to the front and say, Yea, and thus saith the Lord, God has a, an amazing future for you. It's never, it's never a, um, yea, and thus saith the Lord, God has revealed to me that he has an ordinary life for you to live. It's never that, is it? Or that God has revealed to me, you shall uh, be, you know, you shall be experiencing a life of travail and torment and persecution and tribulation, seeming disaster and failure. Yet you shall inherit eternal reward in heaven. No one ever says anything like that. Um, it's always, you know. That, oh, you've been through the valley, but you, God's going to take you to the mountaintops. Um, yeah, it, this is the problem, is that people are, are so established on a feeling-centered Christianity these days. And I believe this is why we have so many people dropping away, is that their faith is is being challenged uh, by the circumstances of life in that they're so feeling-centered rather than so word-centered. Anyway, I'll, I'll get off that. Because faith essentially is trusting what God says in his word and being obedient to that. And this is what the author is really saying, that that those who went before, when we look back at those who went before, they were people who accomplished so much, even though their faith was not complete. You must draw from their example, because it should be a great, a great encouragement to you. Look at what they achieved with a faith that is incomplete. Now, then we um, come to, uh, uh, I should just say in Matthew, Jesus, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay focused here, but Matthew 13, 17 says, for verily I say to you, 
that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear these things which you hear and have not heard them. So this is the same statement as, uh, that Hebrews 11 is expanding. Look at what these people did, waiting to see the things which you've seen. So now, remember, there is also not only the looking back at this great cloud of witnesses, but as a consequence of that, or, or, or uh, not a consequence, but, but with that in the background, the author then says, now, look at your walk. Let us run, uh, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You are in the race, whether you like it or not. So you'd better take a look at a couple of issues. And, and one is to lay aside the weight and the sin. From time to time, um, you know, I, I did this when I was training for hiking. I put on a backpack and I trained uh, with that backpack on and I kept increasing the weight uh, so that my body would be strong enough to be able to handle the rigors of, um, uh, of the challenge that the hike would present to me. And, and I was glad I did that because it was physically a very challenging experience. Um, so now athletes will often do this kind of thing, whether it's swimmers or, or um, uh, distance runners, they will train with weight on, but when it comes to competition day, they strip down to the bare minimum. Um, and, um, you know, so if you're going to compete in the spiritual race of life, the, the author is saying, listen, you're, you're in a race. And this is not a speed race. This is a, um, you're, you know, you're racing for a personal best um, here. So it doesn't matter how other people, how fast they seem to be. Um, but you are to get rid of everything that hinders in this race. You know, and they, those can be from the innocuous, sinless things. Um, because he says, lay aside the weight and the sin. Um, we often think of the sins that should be laid aside, but lay aside the weight and the sin. You, you're in a contest, so to speak. Your commitment to his calling in your life is revealed to the degree that you're willing to lay aside weight and sin. These things which easily beset. Um, the phrase here, beset, the weight and the sin which so easily besets, is, is a, a word meaning to entangle or to, to tangle up or to snare up. And it stands to reason that sin um, would need to be laid aside, but he says lay aside the weight and the sin. Unbelief is, you know, when, when you think of the, um, uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt and um, uh, proceeding to the promised land, that they died in the wilderness for their unbelief. Um, unbelief is taken from two Greek words, meaning disobedience and distrust. Um, lay aside the weight and the sin. Unbelief is the antithesis of faith. Remember that this is being written on the, on the heels of a big lesson about faith and what faith is and what faith accomplished. Uh, and then he says, so therefore, with this understanding about faith, lay aside the weight and the sin which so easily besets. Um, unbelief, from its original meanings, implies that there is an element of distrust and disobedience to God's word. In other words, it is God says, um, do A, 
but we say, whoa, 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 God, I'm not sure that this is right. I want to do B. And, um, and so we harden our hearts against what God directs and we head in our own direction. Um, and, and this is a really dangerous situation because when we harden our hearts in such a way, um, you know, then, then sin is knocking at the door. Hebrews 3 verse 15 says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, for who were the, those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that, he would, that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? We see then they were not able to enter because of unbelief. This, this would be the primary sin to lay aside. Now, it may not be the only meaning. Surely all sin is to be laid aside. But, but a, uh, considering that the lesson of Hebrews chapter 11 was about faith, then unfaith would be a primary thing to lay aside. Um, and the phrase here is that it easily besets and it winds around us and, and uh, Tyndale renders it as the sin that hangeth on us. Um, so I feel compelled to ask, what, what sin is winding around you? It's hanging on you. Um, because it may not be the obvious immoral sins you know, pornography and adultery and things like that. There may be the mental sins as well. What about the sin of fear in contrast to faith? We, we've entered a time now in which the government is acting or enacting uh, regulations that are affecting Christians deeply. And many Christians are just getting on board with what the government is saying and uh, I have to think that in many cases, this is because there is a fear of man at the root of this. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, I, so I wonder, is unfaith uh, something that needs to be laid aside, cast off by you? Are you in a situation where you fear man? Uh, and you, you fear the, the government and the big government agendas. So, um, yeah, look, I'm not sure that I have time to go into, oh, I don't have time to go into that anymore, that's for sure. But um, one of the things that, that is then mentioned out of this, lay aside the every weight and sin which does so easily beset and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And the idea is that we would run with a calm assurance by virtue of faith in the Lord, that, that he is in control. And so we can run with a calm assurance, not, not being hasty, not, not racing ahead, um, not trying to, um, uh, you know, not, not being a sprinter in the race of life. The the call to run with patience is a call to run with a disciplined lifestyle. Um, the, the word there, run with patience, uh, Thayer's renders this to have steadfastness, constancy, and endurance. Um, and it goes on to say that it, this is the characteristic of a man who has not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Patiently and steadfastly, a patient, enduring, sustaining perseverance. Enduring, sustaining perseverance. The great need of our lives um, to help in overcoming the weights and sins is discipline. And, and this is really important for us. Um, because you rarely gain victory without discipline. This life is a race and it is an endurance event. So we need to train and then 
cast off the, the weight and sin and look unto Jesus. Um, so we, we looked at the witnesses. We look at self as to what we can cast off and we look to Jesus. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners. Verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. It's an interesting statement because there are many persecuted believers in that time who had paid the price of the Christian faith in blood. But I believe the author is saying it's actually not really possible for you to resist unto blood striving against sin because there is one blood sacrifice and that is Jesus. So um, you can't accomplish what he has accomplished is what I believe he's saying. And that's, that's a, a talk for another time. Um, but what is your gaze fixed on? Paying off your mortgage, um, paying off your car, getting a promotion, um, but, you know, finishing that course, uh, you know, getting a qualification, all of these things. And these are not illegitimate things, but they can be distracting things. And this is the important part of life because Paul told, uh, he, he told the Corinthian church to follow him as he follows Christ. So, um, you know, it's important for us that we keep our gaze fixed on Jesus. This is the key to your Christian victory. Jesus resisted unto blood. His, his blood sacrifice was complete payment for our sins. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Um, you know, I wonder if we were back at AD 33 and we were witnesses I think it wasn't actually AD 33. Um, but if we were witnesses to the crucifixion, who would we have been? Those hiding in fear and trembling? Those mocking? Would we have been in the baying pack of wolves calling for his blood? Crucify him, give us Barabbas? You see... We are sinners saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Crucify him, crucify him. We may have been in that very crowd calling for his death. Despite the rejection of humanity and the, the fear of his followers, Jesus succeeded in his mission to redeem mankind. And because of that, we are able by faith to walk the, the Christian life um, in a way that the Old Testament saints couldn't. Their faith hadn't been perfected. And so we get told in Hebrews 12 verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I want to encourage you with that this morning, that in these times, you would look unto Jesus. Beloved, the Christian church in the West is coming into a time of serious persecution. There's no doubt about that. And although we may, as citizens, um, campaign for our civil rights and, and various different things, um, you and I as believers are uh, 
also thrust into another category because we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven and sojourners in this world. And so we must understand that this world has an anti-Christ agenda and the God of this world is at work against the God of heaven. Um, so there is going to be a ramping up of persecution against believers. I'm not being fatalistic here. Look unto Jesus. Please, beloved, keep your eyes on Jesus through these times. Stay as astute with political stuff if that's your desire, but don't let that distract you from faithful obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, leave this for some discussion with you guys. Um, maybe you might want to discuss the resistance unto blood um, against sin, striving against sin, not against um, political opponents. Um, what exactly is your gaze fixed on? It might be a question to discuss. God bless you and We'll see you again soon.